Yeah, I'm, I, I see I'm unmuted for that question. I personally haven't seen anything being offered um, to stranded workers, uh, laid off workers, and quite the opposite, as you mentioned, where they're asked to, um, that they're not entitled, de being deemed not entitled to some of that, and including many workers not being entitled to a, um, even unemployment, according to their own state laws. So, so there's um, not much relief at, at the most, I think that, um, there, I, I do see f some foreign workers seeking assistance from their own governments, um, and that may be an, an avenue, but absolutely you're right on for the fact that it's not happening, um, and they're not only being denied the stimulus uh, um, checks, but they're also being denied unemployment insurance. Our last question to you, Kalpana, comes from Jaya Padmanabhan. Um, Jaya? Yeah, thanks, Anita. Um, mm -hmm. Kalpana, this, um, this question is about those who are um, um, being laid off. What, what are the options of, uh, for people who are likely to lose their jobs? What does the landscape look like? I mean, what do H-1B and H-2B workers, um, how can they prevent um, from um, pr protect their jobs? Thanks, Jaya. I think this is a question I receive probably um, every single week in my practice, if not more often than that. Um, unfortunately, you're right that um, people who are uh, losing their jobs in the tech field have limited options. There is a 60-day grace period upon termination of work, which um, H-1B workers can qualify for, which will allow them time to look for a job with another employer and that's typically the ideas that we are using as well as looking at if they're able to qualify for changing their status uh, to another visa category so, so many times um, both the um, spouses are on h1bs and then one of them might be able to go on into a dependent visa with their spouse those are some of the the potential opportunities that are there Thank you so much, Kalpana. We're going to move on to Ignacia Rodriguez. Um, she is, I'm sorry, Ignacia, she's an immigration policy advocate with the National Immigration Law Center, which has been a consistent voice on DACA and temporary protected status. Reporters, please note that Ignacia's last name is spelled with a Z and not an S, mm -hmm. as we had in our invitation. So please correct that in your reporting. Ignacia, welcome. Hello, thank you so much. Hello, I'm Ignacia Rodriguez, Kmetz, Immigration Policy Advocate at the National Immigration Law Center. The Trump administration's Department of Homeland Security issued a new memo on July 28th following a decision by the U.S. Supreme Court in June, finding that the administration's 2017 rescission of DACA was arbitrary and capricious. The court's decision restores DACA to its original implementation in 2012. The new DHS memorandum, while saying that it is an interim decision while the administration figures out what to do with the DACA program, drastically alters DACA. This latest move has added to the uncertainty immigrant youth have experienced under this administration. I'll be sharing guidance for DACA recipients and guidance for those who wanted to request DACA for the first time. The July 28th DHS memo directs USCIS to reject any initial DACA requests, meaning from people who have never had DACA before. Individuals who applied for DACA for the first time in light of the Supreme Court decision should expect to receive notice that their initial request has been rejected and will have their application and associated fees returned to them by mail. The July 28th memo directs USCIS to reject advanced parole applications from DACA recipients and return them along with their filing fee to the applicant unless USCIS determines the applicant demonstrates exceptional circumstances. It is not clear what USCIS will consider to be an exceptional circumstance. The memo also clarifies that any already approved advanced parole issuances Will remain valid. If you're interested in advanced parole, we recommend you speak to an attorney or a DOJ accredited representative 
before applying and before you travel outside of the United States, even if you have been granted advanced parole. USCIS will continue accepting and processing DACA renewal requests. Those who are eligible for renewal should still consider submitting the request, especially if they have less than 150 days before their current DACA expires. We recommend that individuals consider renewing their DACA, consult an attorney or a DOJ accredited representative who can provide an individualized assessment, including whether they are eligible for another more permanent form of immigration relief. Based on the DHS memo, if your DACA renewal request is approved, your DACA and employment authorization will be valid for one year rather than two. If your DACA and employment authorization have already been approved for two years, your DACA and work authorization will remain valid for two years, but the next time you apply for DACA, if approved, your new DACA and employment authorization will be for one year, not two. The per application fee remains the same, $495, but this move effectively doubles the cost for DACA recipients and places the burden on DACA recipients to renew every year. This is of great concern because the ability to pay DACA-related fees has long been an obstacle for many DACA recipients, and at a time when many are facing unprecedented financial hardship, this additional yearly fee could hinder eligible individuals from applying, putting at risk their employment authorization and protection from deportation. This abrupt change in the middle of a health and economic crisis to a program that has been in existence for eight years, warrants further the need for Congress to automatically extend DACA and work authorization, and to do the same for temporary protected status holders, which is another community whose lives have been upended by the Trump administration's attacks. We'll continue monitoring DACA renewal processing because we are concerned that USCIS's budget problems, as well as the recent changes to USCIS's policy manual, may cause delays in processing. On July 15th, USCIS released an updated USCIS policy manual, creating additional steps for USCIS officers to take. People applying for immigration relief like DACA, TPS, and for work authorization must now show that a favorable exercise of discretion is warranted, in addition to showing that they meet all other eligibility requirements for the specific immigration relief they're applying for. USCIS officers must now evaluate a list of discretionary factors to determine if the person warrants the immigration relief and or work authorization. For example, what they've done since arrival ties to the US, and any health issues. We are concerned that this would lead to arbitrary immigration relief denials and even longer adjudication and processing wait times for certain immigration relief and work authorization requests, since officers now have to do this extra analysis and document it. All these things add up to make life as difficult as possible for immigrants trying to navigate an already complex system. This is yet another reason why we need Congress to step in and provide relief. Thank you. The valuable overview from all our speakers. I have two quick questions for our speakers. First, is there another shoe that's about to drop? Will there be an October surprise move against immigrants that continues this escalating uh, set of measures to make life harder. And second, if the new administration uh, is democratic and Biden has proposed making immigration his first policy uh, priority, um, what would be an appropriate first step for him to take. So those are both political, I realize, but. 
Um, I can start with the first question, if that's helpful. Uh, for So for next shoes <laughs> um, that we're waiting to drop, the president just signed an executive order on federal contracting, restricting, um, or it, it doesn't change anything immediately, but the end result likely will be restricting the ability of federal contractors to use um, foreign nationals. But within that executive order was a reference to future or upcoming H-1B changes that should happen within the next 45 days. Um, so I think sometime in the next month and a half, we're going to see further restrictions to the H-1B program uh, with a particular aim at um, foreign companies, foreign consulting companies that use H-1B workers and place them off-site at U.S. companies. So I think we're, we're anticipating that. And then I'll, I'll just quickly put in my two cents for the second question, which I think the easiest thing for a, a future Democratic president to reverse, and, and it would also be a very visible and strong signal that the U.S. is changing its tone on immigration, would be the original travel ban, that original travel ban. And, um, and, you know, uh, meetings with their staff in D.C. Um, and my prior roles with the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And, you know, the, the reality is Congress has not been able to do what it needs to do. And we are continuing to govern our immigration laws through executive action. Um, and members of Congress tell me pl flat out, please keep suing. And so there's these big lawsuits, but there's also other tools in our toolbox, which is in individuals their cases can often are un arbitrarily denied and every time i talk to them about well let's not do it you know why don't we consider a lawsuit they immediately back down and that's really not that's got to change because we either have to fix the immigration system or we at least have to do enough to try to keep getting it to be more accountable through the methods that are available to, through the tools that are available to us thank you ignacia would you like to uh address this question as well? Yes, so addressing um, the first question um, around what's to be expected, possibly in October, um, the reality is that we're always on alert, we're always preparing for the, even for the unexpected. We've become experts at that um, during this administration. Um, so a good example is, for example, the census. Um, so in July 21st of 2020, a memorandum was released by this administration um, stating that it's going to exclude or its intention to exclude undocumented immigrants, right? And we heard about this issue in 2019. The Supreme Court decision weighed in on whether or not um, you can ask a citizenship question in the census. Um, so again, something that was an issue in June of 2019 comes back to us in July of 2020. So we're always preparing um, for anything that the administration may present. Um, and then the second question is quite loaded, right? Can a new administration change some of these actions? Um, and focusing specifically on DACA, um, it, there's really an easy fix to it. Um, so this memorandum, the July 28th memorandum, um, is an interim memorandum while the administration decides what to do with the program. Um, so if Trump has a second term, 